I'm 22 years old, and my name is Carol. I recently received my college degree, and I have a tale to share regarding my house. Actually, it was my mother's house until she died of intestinal cancer four years ago, at which point I inherited it. Even before the cancer diagnosis, mom was always the planner. She ensured that everything was in its proper place. She had the home all to herself. Thank God mom had the wisdom to purchase it before she had ever met my dad. She also made sure I was aware of the will. Despite everything she was going through, Mom assured me, this way you'll always have a home, in a firm voice. It wasn't always this difficult. Before Dad left us for another woman, my parents were married for 10 years. When he packed his luggage, I was nine years old. He simply departed without any fuss or argument about property or custody. He just consented to cover the cost of my college education. He immediately deposited the full amount to a dedicated account for my future education. That must have been his take on child support. Dad promptly began a new family. Soon later, his wife, Linda, gave birth to their daughter. She is 10 years my junior. I occasionally went to stay at their leased home, but it was never comfortable. Linda would be busy straightening my half-sister's hair or singing about her most recent achievement. Dad said he had to support his family, thus he was constantly working. It's funny because I no longer truly fit within that group. Carol, would you like to join us for dinner? Linda would inquire, but it was always clear from her tone that she hoped I would say no. However, we maintained a friendly relationship exchanging Christmas greetings, birthday cards, and the odd forced family meal. In that awkward manner that makes your skin crawl, everything seemed really courteous and correct. As a senior accountant, Mom earned a comfortable living, so she was able to devote all of her attention to her cancer treatment. When we received the diagnosis, I was 14. In order to concentrate on battling the illness, she resigned her work right away. We spent four years alternating between therapy sessions and hospital stays. Mom never once voiced any complaints. She simply persisted in battling, preparing, and checking on me. Plans, however, don't matter to cancer. She passed away when I was 18, a few weeks before I was set to go to another state for college. I was struck with sadness. I was scarcely able to function. Dad astonished me by genuinely taking charge at that point. To help me deal with the loss, Dad, Linda, and my half-sister temporarily moved in. At the time, I was too thankful for whatever help I could obtain to question it since I was too numb. Dad threw his arm over my shoulders and said, we'll help you through this. In an attempt to appear understanding, Linda nodded as my half-sister looked about the house that was now mine. I had a problem toward the end of the summer. I had no idea what to do with Mom's house, which was now my own, and college was just a few weeks away. Although I couldn't stomach the idea of selling it, it also didn't seem wise to leave it unoccupied for four years. It was at breakfast one morning when Dad made his proposal. I've been thinking, Carol, he remarked, putting down his coffee mug. How about if we remained here? You won't have to worry about anything while you're in school because we take care of the place and pay all the expenses. I turned to face Linda, who was at the stove preparing pancakes. She grinned as she turned around. It would benefit us all, she continued. The house would be well maintained and Sophie is already enrolled in the nearby school. It was logical. Surprisingly, everything had gone well during the two months they had been staying with me. My half-sister Sophie had actually begun to treat me like a genuine sister rather than a stranger who periodically appeared, and Linda had stopped being so aloof. I thus concurred. In retrospect, that appeared to be the ideal answer. I took what I wanted from Mom's personal belongings and put the rest in the attic. I felt secure in my choice when I departed for college. 
I spent the following four years returning home for summer vacations and holidays. In fact, their visits were pleasant. These large welcome home feasts were prepared by Linda. As though she had always known my likes, she would add, I made your favorite lasagna. Sophie would pull me into her room to discuss school drama or show me her most recent artwork. We would all work together to adorn the tree throughout Christmas vacations. While Linda and I engaged in a friendly debate about whether tinsel was traditional or tacky, Dad would raise Sophie to place the star on top. Sometimes I could almost forget that this wasn't the family I was born into as we sat about sipping hot chocolate. Summertime visits were longer and more laid back. In addition to helping Sophie with her summer reading, Sophie and I would spend afternoons at the communal pool. When Linda invited me to her book club meetings, we would genuinely enjoy discussing the romantic book they had selected for the month. Your sister's so good with Sophie, I overheard Linda telling Dad one evening. It's nice having her home. That made me feel warm inside, like maybe we really had become a proper family. I called regularly during semesters, weekly chats with Dad about my classes, catching up with Linda about house maintenance. The roses you planted are blooming beautifully, Carol, and FaceTime sessions with Sophie, who kept me updated on her middle school adventures. Everything seemed perfect. We created this strange but functional family dynamic, built on the foundation of my mother's house. I never imagined it could all fall apart so quickly. But I guess that's the thing about houses. No matter how solid the foundation, you never know what's going on behind the walls. Finally, at 22, with my degree in hand and a job lined up back home, I was ready to start the next chapter of my life. I'd already accepted a position at Marshall and Brooks Financial in my hometown. They'd interviewed me via Zoom and offered me the job right away. Everything was falling into place perfectly, or so I thought. The taxi dropped me off in front of my house on a sunny June afternoon. I stood there for a moment, taking in the familiar sight. Mom's rose bushes were in full bloom though they looked different from how she used to maintain them. The lawn was neatly trimmed and new curtains hung in the windows, little changes that had happened while I was away at college. Wheeling my suitcases up the front walk, I reached for my keys with a smile, already imagining sleeping in my old room tonight. But when I tried to unlock the door, something was wrong. The key wouldn't turn. I tried again, thinking maybe I was just tired from the journey, but no, the key definitely didn't fit. What the hell? I muttered, trying the key again before finally giving up and knocking on the door loudly, since it was the middle of the day and they might be watching TV. Linda opened the door, her eyes widening in surprise. She was wearing an apron and had flour on her hands, like sheep and baking. Carol, what are you doing here? I wheeled my suitcase inside, noticing Dad and Sophie in the living room, both looking equally startled by my appearance. Sophie was sprawled on the couch with her phone, while Dad sat in his favorite armchair, Mom's old armchair, actually reading something on his tablet. What do you mean? I live here, I said, looking around at what seemed like subtle changes to the living room decor. Why were the locks changed? Dad touched his neck, that nervous habit he's had since forever. Oh, that. Yeah, I changed them last month for safety. You know, there were some break-ins in the neighborhood. You could have told me. I said, trying to keep the annoyance out of my voice, or send me a new key. I mean, this is my house. We weren't expecting you. Linda said carefully, her arms crossed over her chest. She'd wiped the flower off her hands and was looking increasingly uncomfortable. Why not? I graduated last week. I told you guys I was coming home to start my new job. I looked between them, feeling increasingly uneasy. Something was off about their reactions. Sophie had even put down her phone and was watching the scene unfold with an odd expression. 
Carol, Dad cut in suddenly, standing up. Can we talk in the office for a minute? I followed him into Mom's old office, my office now, technically. The room still had Mom's degrees on the wall and her collection of financial reference books on the shelves. He closed the door behind us, and I noticed his hands were shaking slightly as he turned to face me. Listen, honey, he started, his voice low. There's something you need to know. Linda, well, she thinks this house belongs to me. I stared at him, not comprehending. What? I told her it was my house. He continued, not meeting my eyes. That I gave it to your mother and you out of kindness after the divorce, and that after your mom passed, it reverted to me. She thinks she'd just been living here because I allowed it. I must have stood there gaping at Dad for a full minute before finding my voice again. My first instinct was to storm out of the office and tell Linda everything. Now I understood her surprised look when I showed up. In her mind, I was just some freeloader trying to crash in their house. I have to tell her the truth, I said, moving toward the door, but Dad caught my arm. Please, Carol, he begged, his voice barely above a whisper. Just give me a little time. I'll find us a new place to live, I promise. I just need to figure out how to tell her without destroying our marriage. Destroying your marriage? I hissed. What about what you're doing to me? He pulled a set of keys from his pocket, holding them out like a peace offering. These are for the new locks. Please, sweetheart, just a few weeks. That's all I'm asking. Let me handle this my way. I took the keys, feeling sick to my stomach. Fine, I said finally. But this is insane, Dad. You know that, right? He nodded, relief washing over his face. Thank you, honey. I'll make this right, I promise. But things started going downhill immediately. At dinner that night, the atmosphere was thick with tension. Linda kept shooting me these looks across the table, all her previous warmth gone. The woman who used to bake my favorite cookies and invite me to book club now acted like I was a stranger who'd wandered in off the street. More potatoes? Dad asked, completely oblivious to the tension. Would anyone mind if I redecorate the living room? Linda asked suddenly, not looking at me. The current setup is a bit dated. I gripped my fork tighter, knowing she was talking about Mom's furniture arrangement. Dad coughed awkwardly and changed the subject. The next morning, I was making coffee when Linda cornered me in the kitchen. She was still in her robe, hair uncombed, but her eyes were sharp and focused. Carol, she said, leaning against the counter, I think we need to talk about your plans. My plans? Yes. When are you planning to look for your own place? She asked casually, like she was asking about the weather. Now that you have a job lined up, you should start thinking about moving out. You're a grown woman now, after all. I took a slow sip of coffee, counting to ten in my head. Actually, I've talked to Dad about staying here for now. He's fine with it. Linda's lips pressed into a thin line, and for a moment I thought she might argue. Instead, she just turned and walked out of the kitchen, leaving me alone with my cooling coffee and a growing sense of dread about how this was all going to play out. The next two weeks were like living in a hostile environment. Linda's attitude shifted from cold to downright passive-aggressive. She'd accidentally wash my clothes with colors that would bleed, claiming she forgot which laundry basket was mine. She'd cook family dinners but conveniently make just enough for three people, acting surprised when I came to the table. When I tried to watch TV in the living room, she'd suddenly need to vacuum right there. If I was using the kitchen to make breakfast, she'd barge in and start reorganizing the cabinets, muttering about how some people never learn to keep things tidy. She even moved my mother's favorite vase from its spot on the mantel to some corner shelf, claiming it didn't match her new decorating vision. The worst part was watching Sophie follow her mother's lead. 
My half-sister, who just weeks ago had been sending me memes and calling me for advice about boys, now rolled her eyes whenever I entered a room. She started calling me that girl when talking about me to her friends on the phone, loud enough for me to hear. Despite the tension at home, my professional life was taking off. I visited Marshall and Brooks Financial, where they showed me my future workspace, a nice corner desk with a view of downtown. My future colleagues seemed friendly and welcoming, especially Sarah from the risk assessment team, who offered to take me to lunch. When do you start? She asked over sandwiches. Two weeks, I replied. Just enough time to settle in at home. That evening at dinner, I shared my start date with the family, trying to maintain some semblance of normalcy. They showed me my office today. I start in two weeks, I said. Linda's fork clinked against her plate as she set it down with exaggerated care. Well, isn't that wonderful? Once you get your first paycheck, you can start looking for your own apartment. I know of some nice complexes across town, very affordable for young professionals. I caught Dad's pleading look across the table. His eyes seemed to beg me to keep quiet, to maintain his lie just a little longer. I stabbed at my peas and said nothing to avoid the tension at home. I started reconnecting with old high school friends. Katie and Jessica were still in town, and we'd meet for coffee or shopping trips, falling back into our old rhythms as if no time had passed. But coming home was always uncomfortable. I'd walk in and hear hushed conversations from the kitchen or living room that would stop abruptly when I appeared. Dad and Linda would spring apart like guilty teenagers. Papers would be hastily shoved into drawers, and fake smiles would plaster themselves across their faces. Saturday morning, I woke up to an unusually quiet house. No sound of Linda's weekend meal prep in the kitchen, no Sophie's music blasting from her room, no Dad watching sports on TV. The silence felt wrong somehow, like the calm before a storm. I padded downstairs in my pajamas, checking each room as I went. The kitchen was spotless, not just clean, but unused since the night before. The living room was empty, the throw pillows perfectly arranged on the couch. Sophie's boots, usually cluttering the entryway, were gone. Even Dad's car wasn't in the driveway. I checked my phone, no messages, no notes about where everyone had gone. My first thought was that maybe they'd gone out for breakfast, but something fell off. They never went out for breakfast without at least leaving a note. Even during these tense weeks, they'd maintained that basic courtesy. I tried calling Dad first, but his phone went straight to voicemail. Weird. I tried a few more times with the same result, that automated voice telling me the person I was trying to reach was unavailable. Hanat started forming in my stomach. Finally, I called Linda. She picked up on the fourth ring, just as I was about to hang up. What do you want? Her voice was sharp, hostile in a way I'd never heard before. In the background, I could hear waves and what sounded like tropical music. I just wanted to know where everyone is. I said, caught off guard by her tone. I woke up and the house was empty. She laughed, an ugly, mean sound that made my stomach clench. Oh, didn't we tell you? We're in the Maldives. First class flights, luxury resort, the works. We didn't mention it because, frankly, we didn't want you tagging along and expecting us to pay for you too. Not that you'd know anything about paying for things yourself. What? Save it, she cut me off. I'm sick of this whole situation. You're nothing but a lazy freeloader, living in our house like you own the place. Your father might put up with it, but I'm done. Do you know how embarrassing it is to have a grown woman living in our house, eating our food, using our utilities? My hands were shaking so hard I could barely hold the phone. I sank into one of the kitchen chairs, my mother's chair, actually, my legs suddenly too weak to hold me up. Linda, I. 
No, you listen to me, she snarled. Your father never loved you. You were just an obligation. He already wasted enough money on your college education. And now you're squatting in our house like some entitled princess. Well, I've had enough. Did you think you could just live here forever, mooching off us while we work hard to maintain this home? I could hear Sophie giggling in the background and Dad's muffled voice saying something I couldn't make out. The betrayal felt like a physical blow. When we get back, she continued, her voice dripping with venom, I want you gone. Do you understand me? Pack your things and get out of our house. If you're still there when we return, I'll throw you out myself. And trust me, I won't be gentle about it. I don't care where you go, live on the street for all I care. You're not our problem anymore. And don't bother trying to call your father. He agrees with me. He's just too weak to tell you himself. We've already blocked your number. Have a nice life, Carol, or don't, I really couldn't care less. The line went dead. I sat in that kitchen for what felt like hours, fury slowly replacing shock. They were living in my house, the house my mother had worked for, had left to me. And they had the nerve to call me a freeloader, to try to throw me out. Well, I'd had enough of playing along with Dad's lies. I blocked their numbers on my phone, my hands still shaking, but now with anger rather than hurt. Then I started methodically going through the house, gathering their belongings. Linda's expensive clothes, Sophie's school stuff, Dad's golf clubs, everything went into boxes and suitcases. I worked through the entire Saturday, fueled by rage and bitter disappointment. By Sunday morning, I had their life packed up and stacked in the garage. I found a 24-hour locksmith who could come right away. He worked quickly, replacing the locks on all the doors. It cost a small fortune, but it was worth every penny. When he finished, I handed him my credit card, feeling a strange sense of satisfaction as I clutched the new keys. Monday morning, I started my new job at Marshall and Brooks. For two weeks, I threw myself into work, learning the ropes, making new friends, trying not to think about the confrontation I knew was coming. I kept their stuff in the garage, but I rearranged the house back to how Mom had it, removing every trace of Linda's decorating vision. Then came that Friday. I pulled into the driveway after work to find them standing there, Dad looking nervous, Linda red-faced with fury, and Sophie hanging back with a scowl. They must have just gotten back from their vacation. Their suitcases were still in their rental car. Linda started screaming before I even got out of my car. How dare you change our locks? How dare you lock us out of our own house? I walked calmly past them to unlock the door. Linda followed, still yelling. We're calling the police. This is breaking and entering. This is our house. I turned to face them, something inside me finally snapping. No, Linda, it's not your house. It never was. This house belongs to me. My mother bought it before she even met Dad. She left it to me in her will. The only reason you've been living here is because I allowed it temporarily. Linda laughed, but it was an uncertain sound. She looked at Dad. Tell her she's lying. Tell her this is our house. Dad wouldn't meet anyone's eyes. He just shrugged his shoulders, slumping. She's telling the truth, he said. The house, it was always hers. I watched as the truth sank in, as Linda's face transformed from rage to calculation in a matter of seconds. Her entire demeanor changed, like a switch had been flipped. Oh, Carol, sweetheart, she said, forcing a laugh. You didn't think I was serious on the phone, did you? I was just joking. You know how I can get sometimes. All that sun and those tropical cocktails went to my head. Stop it, I said quietly, but she kept going. We're family, remember? All those nice times we had the book club meetings, the holiday dinners. We can have that again. 
She took a step toward me, arms outstretched like she was going to hug me. Dad jumped in then, his voice thick with emotion. Princess, I'm so sorry. I know I handled this all wrong, but I love you. You're my daughter. Please, can't we work this out? I looked at him, really looked at him, the father who left when I was nine, who paid for my education but missed my life, who lied about my house, my inheritance, my mother's legacy. Work what out, Dad? The fact that you lied to your wife about owning my house, or the fact that you stood by while she planned to throw me out of it. Linda turned back to me with that smile. Let's be sensible, Carol. Together, we can all live here. We'll cover the rent. No, I firmly answered. We are unable to. The garage contains your belongings. Take them and go. Linda's mask broke again at that point. You ungrateful little, after everything we've done for you, you throw your own family out on the street. As I answered, I felt strangely at ease. You recently went on a lavish vacation that you purposefully kept hidden from me, spending what? $10,000? You're probably able to afford an apartment. Carol, please. Dad reached for my arm once again. I know I messed up, but... No, I interrupted him. You made no mistakes. You told a falsehood. Four years, you gave your wife the impression that she was the owner of my mother's home. You saw her attempt to reorganize everything, remodel it, and remove any traces of her mother. And you remained silent while she made plans to expel me. He objected I was going to tell her the truth. When, after I had left, what she had completed relocating to my house. I gave a head shake. I'm finished. Gather your belongings and leave. I ignored Linda's cries of cruelty and ingratitude as I went inside and shut the door. I observed from the glass as they loaded boxes into their rental car from the garage. Linda's face was still flushed with rage as she continued to rant. Sophie was in tears. Dad simply had a dejected expression. To obtain everything, they had to make three journeys. Dad knocked on the door one last time as they loaded the final box. I didn't open it. At last, when the sun was lowering, they departed. Dad tried phoning from a different number the next day. Carol, please, he said desperately. We can fix this. I answered, no, Dad, we can't. Linda was rather explicit about how you all truly feel about me. A freeloader, a duty, someone you never cared for. Perhaps she uttered such things, but your silence was sufficient. Two months have passed since then. I still reside in my mother's home. I have restored it to my own, repainted the walls, and planted fresh roses in the garden. Though I occasionally wonder where they ended up, my thoughts are largely about my mother and how she ensured that I would always have a place to call home. Dad still makes occasional attempts to call from various numbers. I no longer answer the phone. After burning, certain bridges ought to remain ashes. It's funny because I feel happy now. I'm doing well at work. I feel at ease in this house for the first time since Mom passed away, and I've met new acquaintances at work. Letting go of people, falsehoods, and the idealized family you once wished to believe in is often necessary for healing.